this is part two of the video lecture on the relationship between the church and state. This is for the Theology II class at the East Asia School of Theology. So when we ended our first lecture, we were looking at some different models um, that we've seen throughout history for the relationship between church and state. So um, the first model we looked at was integration. A second model we looked at was separation. And now we're going to look at a third model, which is eradication. Um, now this model is the approach that was taken by communist governments uh, during the 20th century, and it has continued into the 21st century. So during the Soviet era, the government of the Soviet Union and her East European out satellite mounted an aggressive campaign to completely exterminate religion from their entire society. This often involved the use of physical force from tearing down church buildings, the expropriation of church funds, and even the imprisonment and execution of Christians. It is unknown how many Christians died or were in prison during this period. The application of this effort to exterminate religion varied from time to time and from place to place with some instances where Christians were allowed relatively more freedom at certain times and in certain places and, and considerably less freedom at other times and in other places. But even during those times when Christians were allowed relatively more freedom, the expectation on the part of those governing authorities in these communist nations was that Christianity, together with all other religions, would eventually wither, and that religious belief and practice would eventually become a thing of the past. Even today, we can still see this approach being taken in those countries that are still communist, such as China, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and Cuba. Once again, the level of persecution may vary from country to country and even from region to region within these nations, but the government, governments are still remain officially hostile toward Christianity and hostile toward all other religions. For example, in North Korea, Christians are sent to labor camps that are, according to many reports, nothing more than death camps. China is currently engaged in a campaign to sinicize Christianity in order to make it conform to communist ideology, a campaign that includes rewriting the entire Bible to fit the communist narrative. We also see um, eradication in the approach taken by sec militant secular humanism. Um, and this approach is very much at work in Western society today, including in those parts of the world that are influenced by the West. Um, and this approach is responsible for much of the removal of religious influence from our public arenas today. This represents an, in, an intentional program of secularization and naturalism. Now, naturalism is the belief that the natural world is all there is, that there is no supernatural reality. So these people seek to remove all traditionally religious views, not just Christianity from our society. In its place, they want to establish secular humanism 
and the tenets of naturalism in, in the schools, in government, and all publicly supported institutions. This movement has taken many different forms during recent decades. Um, for example, militant atheists such as Richard Dawkins and others have written books such as The God Delusion, which argues that religion, any religion, is dangerous not only to human progress, but even to human survival. Uh, they point to the actions of religious terrorists, such as the 9-11 attacks and the recently religiously motivated attacks on various different religious groups in Singapore and elsewhere to argue that religion is not simply dangerous to progress, but that religion is dangerous to human survival itself. Um, the deconstruction movement um, has seen many Christians leaving the faith. Now, deconstruction is a movement where people, where Christians or other religious believers are encouraged to um, re-examine their faith. And, um, you know, a, a lot of these movements actively try to encourage Christians and other religious believers to doubt their faith. Um, and so this deconstruction movement has seen many Christians leaving the faith. This movement has been highlighted by a number of high profile celebrities who used to be major Christian celebrities appearing on a number of social media posts. And now they appear on social media posts such as YouTube and other social media platforms to announce that they no longer believe in Christianity and have left the Christian faith altogether. So that's another part of this militant secular humanist movement that we're seeing these days. Another element of this movement is the mocking of Christian beliefs or of religious beliefs in general in movies, TV shows, on religious media, and even in various advertisements. Christians are generally pictured as being intolerant, narrow-minded, and even anti-intellectual, despite the countless ways that Christianity has contributed to human flourishing over the past 2,000 years. Now, we know that there are Christians who fit these stereotypes. Unfortunately, there are Christians who are um, intolerant, narrow-minded, and anti-intellectual. Anti but that is not the majority of Christians. Most Christians are not intolerant. Most Christians are not narrow-minded. And most Christians are not anti-intellectual. News stories about sexual misconduct by Catholic and Protestant clergy are often used by militant humanists, militant secular humanists, to highlight the moral failings of Christians. These accusations are especially damaging because Christianity has historically upheld high moral standards of behavior. And so, um, this is why it's very important for all of us as Christian ministers to guard ourselves in our relationships with others so that we will not fall into the sin of sexual misconduct. So this is um, the third type of relationship between church and state that we've seen in uh, church history, eradication. Now let's look at a fourth approach to the relationship between church and state, and that is freedom in tension, okay? In this approach, the emphasis is on the idea that God, God calls government to be responsible for some things, and God calls the church to be responsible for 
other things. So people who hold this view might also be called moderates. They are people who seek out something of an uneasy reciprocal relationship between the church and the state. I will say more about what, what this actually looks like in concrete terms below, since this option is the most difficult to apply, primarily because there are so many gray areas that make a uniform application of its principles a real challenge. But at the same time, I think it is the option that seems to produce the most livable situation for people of all faiths, including those of atheists and agnostics, even though there are certain important reservations. Not everything that these people want can be permitted. There are and must be important boundaries around the entire enterprise of legislation and governmental moral guidance. So the idea is this, freedom from relig of religion, the freedom of religion and legislation by the state exists in a delicate tension that con is constantly being checked and balanced by each other. But this assumes a couple of important things. First of all, <clears throat> there must be certain foundational principles that form the bedrock of all legislative processes. Now, in America, for example, this is the idea of a republic over and against a true democracy. Uh, there are many people in America who want America to become more of a true democracy because they feel that even a republic is not completely um, egalitarian and it's not completely equal. In a true democracy, the majority decides no matter how wrong or immoral that majority might be. Um, for example, in uh, Germany during the 1920s and 1930s, Adolf Hitler never got a majority of the German vote, but he got enough of the German votes to become the Chancellor of Germany on January 30th, 1933. Uh, so that is an example of people in a democracy making a really huge mistake. Now, granted, they were deceived, but this highlights the fact that in a democracy, people, there is no guarantee that the people will always choose to do the right thing. But in a republic, there is a system, not only of representative government, but also a system of law that is the basis for all other lawmaking, regardless of the majority sentiment. Now, this foundation is now under fire in the world today, but America's founding fathers thought that universal natural law was the best basis for lawmaking. Much of this law, they argued, was embodied in the Old and New Testament, but not exclusively or ubiquitously. Much American law was grounded in English common law and in the Greek and Roman legal code as well. The point here is that freedom was assumed on the basis of certain limiting parameters. That is, there were certain limits put in place, okay? This is why Jefferson, aware of this, said that America's constitution was only adequate to govern a moral people, a people who are practicing self-restraint, 
and are not being restrained merely by ex the external force of law or the fear of temporal punishment. Now, I just want to make a note uh, here that natural law theory says that the more moral a people are as a whole, the more freedom they have. And notice I said as a whole, because in every society, you're going to have people who are very sinful. So that's why I said natural law argues that the more moral a people are as a whole, the more freedom they will have. And the flip side of that is the less moral people are as a whole, the less freedom they will have. And that's because um, when people are less moral, they begin to do terrible things. And eventually, that will call, lead to chaos. And the government must step in to restore order. And when a people are less moral, the government will typically restore order by taking away people's freedom and taking away people's rights. So freedom of religion was granted. So as long as that freedom did not violate the foundational principles that undergirded the laws of the land. And secondly, the church had a vital and ongoing role in calling the government to moral and legal accountability for how it was ruling the people and making and applying the laws of the land. So the church was always free to raise concerns and disagree with the government, and the government was always obligated to maintain its dedication to the foundation of natural law. This assumes that there is some sort of dialogue between the church and state. Okay. Now, the idea of the rule of law, or lex rex, the law is king, versus the rule of those in power, rex lex, the king is law, is the only thing that will preserve us from the tyranny of modernism and postmodernism. This rule of law also provides the government with the foundation of determining what religious practices are permissible and what practices are not. As to the specific cases of religious freedom and practice, the application of law to them is certainly less, less black and white and far more unclear. But it is a tension I think we have to live with if we are to avoid tyranny, nominalism, or the re relegation of the church to an irrelevant and quaint status as it largely is in Europe now. So let's, okay, so, these are the different models of relationship between the church and the government. Now, let's look at the, this question. According to the Bible, what are the primary God-ordained roles of human government? And we see um, the key text for us is Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, where Paul talks about the role of government, how God has ordained government to help provide law and order to, to punish the wicked and to reward the righteous. So let's look at these primary God-ordained roles of human government. First, the first primary role of human government is to provide exemplary moral leadership. This means that leaders of government should be men and women who have lives, who practice lives of integrity, 
to lead wives of integrity. Um, that is not always the case, but this is one of the roles that human government have because leaders are supposed to provide a moral example for everybody else. The second, the second primary role of human government is to punish wrongdoers. So domestically or inside the country, this is done by the police, by the court, by prisons, et cetera. Now, internationally or outside of the country, um, wrongdoers are punished through, you know, diplomacy. You know, diplomacy is often undertaken to either, um, either um, contain wrongdoing or to even punish wrongdoing through things like economic sanctions. But if diplomacy fails, then wrongdoing is punished on the international stage often by military means. Now, war is a terrible thing, and this is a question that is addressed in um, ethics classes when we look at um, whether at the ethics of war, whether it is, permiss it is permissible to fight wars or not. But this is one of the ways that nations often deal with wrongdoing on the international stage. And then the third primary role of human government is to reward those who do what is right. Okay. So what are some of the contemporary roles for government which are less clearly noted in the scriptures? Well, today, um, the um, most governments have a number of contemporary roles that are not quite spelled out in scripture, but they are valid. So the first of these is protection. And this is provided by police officers, firefighters who help protect property, and soldiers who help protect the nation. And police, of course, help protect the public. Okay. A second contemporary role that many governments have is um, to provide economic and international trade policies. So um, many governments are often in the business of regulating the economy. This may be done by raising or lowering interest rates, uh, by, by printing more money or by uh, not printing more money. Um, and other, there are other tools that governments use for helping to regulate the economy. Um, and governments also help set international trade policies. Uh, so some governments might uh, want to um, encourage more imports and more exports. Other countries might want to discourage imports or exports. Then there are social um, policies and services that many governments are involved in. This includes um, international relations uh, with the purpose of building good relations with other nations. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, legislative, the legislative role for government, and that is to make good laws that will benefit all people. Uh, there's judicial and penal role, which is to punish the wicked. There's the educational role that governments often play, which is to teach students what they need to know. There is the regulatory role that many governments play, and that um, is to make rules that will be fair for businesses, consumers, et cetera. Then there's the medical role that many governments play, and that is to help alleviate human suffering. Then there is the provisional role, which is in which um, government may provide care for those who are poor or disabled, 
There's also emergency and natural disaster responses. So um, in, in many countries, when there is a natural disaster, uh, the government will often call the military to go into the community that has been devastated. And these soldiers will go in to not only help protect people and provide law and order, but also to help the people to clean up and rebuild. Um, and then there is um, social and emotional um, needs that government sometimes help um, provide for. Another contemporary role of government is um, infrastructure and logistics. Um, food, this includes food and water distribution. Uh, now, this was traditionally one of the central functions of government since ancient times. Um, in more recent centuries, this responsibility has been largely delegated to private companies. Nevertheless, governments still have a responsibility to see to it that their citizens have enough food and water to live. Um, transportation. Um, is another important infrastructure that many governments provide. And this includes building roads, canals, railroads, airports, et cetera. Um, and then another role that governments often play, provide is, um, trap is waste management and sanitation. And this is vital for public health. So what are the roles that Christians and churches should play in contemporary pluralistic societies? Um, now keep in mind that the early church was born and was raised in a very multicultural and religiously plural society and setting and yet rise. They not only survive, but they actually thrive. Um, so we need to recognize and appreciate the universal image bearing of all human beings. This and doing so opens the door to recognizing, appreciating, and learning from God's gift to humanity, even through those who do not honor or serve God. This enables us to see moral options in societies that are not wholly Christian. Okay, now there are some key scriptural principles that we can keep in mind. The first is that we should be salt and light. This is found in Matthew 5 13 through 16, where Jesus calls us to be salt and light. Um, also, we have um, another principle laid out in Jeremiah 29, 7, where um, God told Jeremiah to write a letter to the um, Jewish exiles in Babylon. And in this letter, Jeremiah uh, urged these exiles to work and pray for the good of the community they were presently living in. And then uh, some key questions we need to ask in, are, are these. From a Christian perspective, what is true freedom? Um, and this is a difficult philosophical question to ask, answer, but it is a, an important question that we need to wrestle with. From a Christian perspective, what is true human freedom? And then a second key question we need to ask is, how can we as Christians honor the image of God in every human being? Okay. And that ends the second part of this video lecture. Um, please go to part three and we will continue our video lecture.